Um, hello everyone, my name is Jan Alterman. I will talk to you today about how to do that reconstruction step. So after you've done the acquisition, which was explained in a very nice introduction by Peter, that makes my job a bit easier today. So where we are at right now in the story is that we have just finished our acquisition. We have shown X-rays through our sample and we have acquired what we call uh, a set of projection images. And then usually the next step is to take that and transform that into a 3D representation of that object where you can look inside that object and that's a reconstruction step. Now, very often that is um, a bit forgotten or taken for granted. You, you load your projections into software, you click reconstruct and you get your reconstruction. There's actually a number of nuances to it and that's what I will, uh, will focus on today, nuances and the options that uh, one has when doing reconstruction. Um, and I will do a sort of a chronological overview starting in the 1970s with what is still the most common technique that is used to reconstruct um, CT data and that's called or that's part of the family of analytical reconstruction methods. Um, and as the name implies, it is a reconstruction method that you sort of naturally arrive at when you when you analyze the problem of doing reconstruction analytically and i will try to give you some insight as into how this works so as you are acquiring your your x-ray projections and let's think the, that we are currently looking at this orange line then as we rotate the sample we acquire different versions of this orange line and we can put one line uh, underneath another and then we create um, a representation of our projections which is called a sinogram. This is a 2D sinogram and that will allow us to reconstruct uh, the center slice of the 3D object but when you are doing the, um, uh, the, uh, the cone beam geometry, as Peter explained so well, then this actually becomes a 3D object that allows you to reconstruct the, the actual object that we are intending to image. So let's look at how this happens. As Peter explained before me, uh, this the, the physics of this thing is well described by Beer Lambert's law. So just to recap, you have your object and you shine x-rays through it. These x-rays have a certain energy, which is called the source energy. And as the x-rays penetrate your object, the, the photons lose energy. And this is a multiplicative effect. So every time your photons pass a, a, a bunch of material, you lose a fraction of that energy. Because this is a multiplicative effect, you see this exponential show up. So you, you're, uh, you have your source energy, it's attenuated in this exponential um, way by the material properties called the attenuation coefficient. And then this is uh, captured by a detector, which is not perfectly um, efficient itself, so that uh, then you get this multiplication with uh, the detector efficiency. So you can analyze your, uh, your reconstruction problem or your acquisition and you end up with an equation like this. And then the goal is to actually reconstruct or, uh, or, or recover this function mu, which is a function of, of, the, of the spatial distribution inside your sample from this equation. Now, doing some mathematical ma manipulation, you can see that you can transform this a bit. So using the, the logarithm there and what you get is this linear equation in uh, in mu and we can simplify this a bit more turn this uh, into a two-dimensional coordinate system with x and y and then by some approximation you get equations like this so you have your mu which represents the in uh, the internal attenuation distribution inside your sample and what we get are these projections, which is just the, um, the integration of this mu along a line. And now the question that reconstruction answers is, how can we calculate this mu from the set of projections? This question has been answered in the early 20th century by a guy called Johan Radon, which is a name that, that you may have heard before. Uh, and, and he made this mathematical theory stating that if you have these integrals through objects, which, were, which are a consequence of the, of the Beer Lambert's law of acquisition, um, then in some cases you can do this reconstruction. 
And a very neat way, I think, of, of analyzing that is through a, a different great scientist, is uh, through uh, um, uh, uh, Jean-Baptiste Fourier, who a bit earlier in history analyzed a similar um, framework of uh, analyzing functions through their integrals. Because what he invented is called the Fourier transform. And that is a framework that allows these functions, mu, to be analyzed in terms of their Fourier coefficients. So what you're doing is you're taking a function and you're analyzing it in terms of the, of the sinusoids that make up the function. Another way of looking at this is saying that instead of looking at individual pixel values, you're looking at the waves that when you add them together, they make up your, um, your image or your sample. And the neat thing about this is that these, this seemingly complex transformation um, is reversible. You can jump between the image domain, which is the reconstruction that you're trying to make, and the Fourier domain just by applying this transform. Um, and in fact, if you analyze this a bit more, and you fill in the, uh, if, if you fill in the, the right numbers here, for example, if you say that uh, ky and uh, kx are zero, then you see that you actually get an integral that is identical to the projection equation. So right away, through this Fourier principle, we can see that there are, there's actually an, an, an analogy between, um, between this transform of going between image and Fourier domain and the projections that we were doing. And um, that's, that's really neat, because knowing that this Fourier transform exists means that instead of thinking about a, an image space that we need to cover, finding a value for every pixel. We can also think about filling the Fourier space, finding a value for every spatial frequency component, for every wave that makes up your image. And that's really equivalent. Painting your, your spatial domain is the same as painting your Fourier space. Um, and that would mean that we have achieved analytical reconstruction. So let me make that a bit more tangible for you. Because of all this mathematics, we get the fact that as you um, project through your sample along these lines, you get, you, you get one line of your projection sinogram. That is equivalent to one line in your Fourier space. Of course, one line is not a full Fourier space. We need a full Fourier space to get an image. Luckily, we rotate our sample, so we get lines along all kinds of different directions. Well, that is also equivalent to acquiring different lines in Fourier space, and we can just add them all together. And as we are doing that, you can see that by rotating around your sample, eventually you, uh, you cover the entire Fourier space. And so you have acquired the full Fourier space that represents your image. And that means you can reconstruct your image by doing the inverse Fourier transform. So hooray, at this point, we have invented an, an analytical reconstruction methods. We take the lines we acquire in spatial domain, we go to Fourier domain, we plug them in, and we run the inverse Fourier transform. That will work. It is a bit mathematically uh, complex for the computers of the 1970s, but luckily, people realized at that point that there is an analogy. You don't actually need to go to the Fourier space to run this procedure because painting all these lines in an overlapping fashion in Fourier space turns out to be equivalent to a very simple operation in the image space. And that operation is called back projecting. So what is back projecting all about? Let me explain here. So suppose you have this red dot in the middle of your sample and you, uh, you, you project uh, your X-rays through it, then the signal you acquire has this, uh, can be thought of as having this peak here in the middle where the red dot is. Back projecting, so that's equivalent to going to Fourier space and, and, and painting the Fourier space, uh, is equivalent to taking that peak and smearing it, uh, smearing it out along the direction that your X-rays were acquired. Doing that for every direction is equivalent to this Fourier trick that I explained. And as you can see in the center now, there appears a peak, which is actually where your circle is. So hooray, we have achieved reconstruction, and this is the reconstruction that you get. And right now we realize uh, that's actually not perfect, 
because this seems to be a very blurred version of that uh, circular object or that, uh, that cylindrical object that we were intending to image. So that's actually not good. What is actually the problem here? Well, that problem can be also be analyzed in Fourier space. Because I was, I was mentioning before, what we need to do is equivalent to fully in-painting this Fourier space. And if you've ever done some uh, house painting, uh, just look at this. This, this does not look like a nice even coat of, coat of paint. In fact, the coat of paint is much thicker in the center of the Fourier space. Why? Because you have went over that uh, uh, much more often than you went over the periphery with your paintbrush. We call that a density variation. In fact, in doing this back projection procedure, yes, you have covered the entire Fourier space, but you have covered the center with too high a density. And so if you want to get an image that looks nice and crisp, you need to account for this density variation. Um, so this is what you would get if you don't account for the density variation in a medical context. And if you account for it, which can simply be done by calculating this density and multiplying in Fourier space, then you get a nice clean crisp image. And um, the signal processing people among you might know this, this theorem, but multiplication in Fourier space, so multiplying with the inverse of the density, is actually equivalent to filtering in the image space. So that would be equivalent to filtering these lines of data that we get. And thus comes the, the name of the, the most famous, most commonly used still reconstruction algorithm. It's called filtered back projection. And that is just a modification of what we explained before. So in filtered back projection, you do this density compensation in the image space. So not by multiplying, but by filtering the projections you get. In other words, instead of this slight peak you get, you filter this slight peak with the well-chosen filter. It actually comes from a mathematical analysis of this problem. Um, and then you back project these filtered things. And if you do that, you get a nice crisp image. So this is the algorithm of filtered back projection and it's the most commonly used. It's probably the, the one that you, you have used before if you've done some reconstruction without thinking much more about it. Uh, and this is uh, how, you, how you can get a reconstruction. Um, I mentioned this was invented in the 1970s. Why? Well, you can sort of see by my explanation. This can be done in terms of 1D signals, in terms of small filters in the, in the image space. Uh, it's revealing to think about it in terms of Fourier space, but you don't actually need Fourier space to implement it, um, which means it's very elegant and very fast. Um, but it's not the only one. There's, there are other methods you can use. Another reason why we like to think in Fourier space is because that allows us to uh, analyze the quality of this reconstruction. And a very important characteristic of quality is the resolution. We can ask ourselves the question, what is the resolution of this reconstruction? And resolution, uh, if you ask this different people, what is resolution? You may get different answers. A very nice definition, I think, is the one that I've put on the slide here, is that resolution is the ability to separate or discern details that are separate. Let me explain that a bit. Suppose that in reality you have a sample that consists of two very fine dots. Then just looking at this, you can see how oh, these are two separate features. If I if I had gotten, if I had imaged this reality with, with, with uh, X-ray CT, if I had done reconstruction with a nice geometry, nice acquisition setup, good magnification, uh, covering the Fourier space, running filtered back projection and so on, then I might have gotten an image that looks like this. And yeah, I can separate these two details. So I have sufficient resolution to separate these two details. Now, on the other hand, suppose that we are in a different situation. Our, um, um, our geometry was a bit different. Our magnification was a bit different, like Peter explained. Then we would have covered a, a different part of the, of the Fourier space. We might have covered a smaller part of the Fourier space. Now, what does that mean? Well, if you cover a smaller part of the Fourier space, the 
the smaller this is, so the the um, the less wide this is, the wider your dot will appear, because the dot is transformed to what is called the um, uh, the point spread function of your system. So your geometry dictates actually how wide that dot will appear. And now still OK, we have now wider dots because the point spread function that's dictated by geometry of your system has made this wider, but we can still separate the details. Of course, the situation might have been a bit worse. Suppose the dots had been closer to one another. Well, in that case, in in, in the um, in the second uh, acquisition geometry and reconstruction uh, geometry, we are no longer able to see that these are two separate dots. So in that case, we say this has insufficient resolution. And so this resolution aspect is, is a really important one because what this analysis shows that the resolution, it depends on the geometry of your system because that dictates how we inpaint the Fourier space. And it is independent of the voxel size. In reconstruction, as you're running filtered back projection or any other reconstruction algorithm, you can, cho you can choose your voxel size. You can say, I'm going to work with voxels of, of, of 100 micron, of 10 micron, of, of, or you can even choose to run it at, at 10 nanometers if you want, but that has no real meaning. The resolution, the ability to separate dots depends on the system geometry, on the way you input into Fourier space. And I've made that link to the point spread function, saying that the, the width of what you inpaint in Fourier space relates to the width of, um, uh, of your point spread function. And as you can see in exotic geometries, that can also mean that the, the resolution uh, depends on the direction that you're looking in. So that would mean that the most appropriate way of voxelizing an image like this is what is, is with, uh, with non-rectangular voxels or non-cubic voxels, which is also an interesting observation. Um, and so typically people um, then express the resolution of their system based on uh, parameters that are only defined by a system geometry, uh, like Peter also explained. So the, the, uh, you have this magnification factor, which, which depends on the, on the distance between the source detector and your object. Um, and, and other than that, uh, you have the resolution of your detector, of course, and the spot size of the X-ray source because we like to think of our X-ray source as, as, um, as emitting these infinitely thin beams of, um, of X-ray energy, but in reality, nothing is perfect, so that is not perfect as well. And note here, this does not relate to, to your choice of how many voxels you want your results to have. It only depends on the system geometry. So now that we know uh, how reconstruction, resolution, um, uh, and, um, and acquisition interact with one another, in the remainder of this lecture, I will talk about um, alternative techniques uh, that have been developed since the 1970s to, um, to get a slightly better or different um, reconstruction. And I will start off with the techniques uh, or the group of techniques called algebraic reconstruction. So we can revisit the, uh, the way that acquisition happens, and this time treat it through the lens of linear algebra. So as we do the, the Beer-Lambert thing again, so we, we shine uh, photons through our sample, we see how they are attenuated. We can relate the values we get in our, um, in our projection to the values uh, that we want to reconstruct from the inside of a sample. And since this is a, this is since we converted this in a linear equation, we might just as well do it using matrix algebra. So essentially saying that the value we get at i at at uh, at y one is actually related to the sum of the attenuation values along this line. These are some of the values in x, which are the attenuation values in our sample, and the values that we actually traversed we we flag with a one, and the values that we haven't traversed we flag with a zero. It's a very simplistic way of looking at this, but in some approximation, this is exactly what happens. You can do this for the other lines in your sample as well, and thus you create a matrix. This, uh, this is sometimes called the acquisition matrix. And so now asking the question, how can we do reconstruction from the data Y? So how can we do reconstruction from uh, the projections? Uh, 
is the same as asking how can we invert this system of linear equations? How can we invert this matrix to get X from Y? And well, there's, a, there's quite a, a straightforward answer to this. This has been studied also in the 20th century. Uh, you can do this using the, uh, the inverse matrix. Usually this matrix is not square. So you would use something called the pseudo inverse matrix. Um, thus solving the inverse problem. And this, uh, this is an alternative way of looking at it. It's equivalent in, in many ways to the analytical um, analysis that I've explained in the beginning of this lecture. Um, and it highlights some of the same issues that that one wants to get around. So for example, here you have this matrix inverse. Now, nobody guarantees you uh, that in a general sense, this matrix is invertible. It may in fact have zero eigenvalues. In that case, it means that you have insufficient data to reconstruct your image. Um, and but if you have sufficient projections, that will not happen. So the same issues that Radon and Fourier were, were tackling um, are issues that that you see pop up in this analytical analysis of the problem as well. Now doing this. Uh, matrix inversion explicitly means that you need to invert a matrix that is a few millions by a few millions. That's never something you do explicitly, uh, especially not in the uh, 1980s, 1990s and so on, because computer power was not where it is right now. And so people, they think about this, but they don't implement this and people have implemented approximations of this. You can do a gradient descent for sure. But the most common uh, way of doing it is, is by using an approximation that allows you to, to do this updates iteratively. So by updating your image many, many times, each time getting you a little bit closer to the, uh, to the eventual solution that you want to obtain. And by doing this, uh, not, by the, not using the entire matrix at once, but using lines in the matrix. And so you update this very many times and eventually you get an approximate solution to the system of equations. This is called the algebraic reconstruction techniques. There's many flavors here, um, and it was first described by a guy called Stefan Kaczmach, which is why it's sometimes called the Kaczmach iteration. Um, so this is an alternative. Um, it's inspired by this numerical approximation of matrix inversion. There's many flavors, but because of the fact that it is iterative, it is typically slower. And so you might want to ask the question, why should I even consider it if you say it's slower? Um, and yeah, at this point we reach a sort of a, an engineering question. We have these different alternatives. Which one should we use? And if there are other alternatives, which one should we use in that case? And to answer that question, we need to look at um, uh, estimation theory. Uh, because estimation theory will give us the answer as to which algorithm is better than another in, in a pure uh, reconstruction sense. And so taking a step back to our um, algebraic analysis of the problem, what we intended to do was to solve this system of linear equations. What we intended to do is to invert this matrix. But actually, we can ask the question, should we do this? Because this assumes that as you do acquisition, you get a, your data is perfect. You get a perfect projection of your data, but nothing in science and engineering is perfect. There are, there's things like noise, um, uh, statistical fluctuations in, in your photon distribution and so on. So nothing is perfect. And if the data is not a perfect projection, then why should we even go for a perfect equality in this equation? And you might already feel where I'm going with this. If there are statistical fluctuations, well, then we need to turn to statistics and estimation theory to get, to, uh, to get a proper answer to how we should reconstruct this. And people have done this as well. So people have, have, um, have said, OK, we are now no longer going to describe the relation between the projection data and our image in an absolute sense. We're going to define it in a probabilistic sense. So for example, they say, if our image is known, if our image is X, then our data now follows a normal distribution, so a Gaussian distribution. Um, 
And uh, the mean of that Gaussian distribution is actually the projections of our X, and it has some covariance matrix sigma. Okay, that's a, a reasonable assumption. Usually when people don't know how to proceed with statistics, the first thing they try is they say, let's assume a normal distribution. And that's fine. Because using that model, now you can um, you can define a so-called estimator. You can estimate the uh, the most likely x that uh, that has given rise to uh, to the data that you're observing. That's called a maximum likelihood estimator. Um, and doing the mathematics here will give you the equation you see at the bottom. And that is actually very close to what we've seen before. This matrix inversion solution, the pseudo inverse. Only now it has this uh, this covariance matrix in there as well, and so that that teaches us a few things. First thing it teaches us is that the uh, the algebraic reconstruction technique is actually um, has a root in estimation theory. So it it assumes essentially that the, that this distribution is a true approximation of reality. In other words, that there is Gaussian noise on our data. It's a fair assessment. And also it assumes that this Gaussian noise has a unit variance, because as you see, this covariance matrix has gone, which is also a reasonable assumption that is often made in practice. Note that this uh, analogy does not hold for the uh, filtered back projection. In fact, you can do the same analysis, but that will lead us too far, um, and, and it will show that filtered back projection uses a, a, a much less realistic model of reality and that is why you often see more noise in, in reconstructions made by filtered back projection. Um, okay, and people have even took, taken this a step further, because why should you even so, assume a normal distribution? You can also look into the physics a bit more and realize that the, especially when, when you have a low flux, that the distribution of your data is, is more akin to a Poissonian distribution. And then you can do exactly the same mathematical exercise with some approximation, and it will also give you a, 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 an algebraic construction algorithm. Um, for example, uh, there's, uh, there's a nice paper about this um, from a while back already. Um, and the images I'm showing here on the slide show you the effect that this can have. So on the left, you see a density phantom. So it's, it's just a cylinder with, with four cylinders inside. If you just do the default filtered back projection that, that most people use, you get the image in the middle here. And if you use this uh, this uh, this algorithm rooted in estimation theory that uses a Poissonian model, you get the image that you see on the right here. So using the right model can have a, a big impact. It doesn't always have a big impact, but under the right circumstances, this has an impact. So. Be aware that this is a possibility that, is, that may be at your disposal. Um, now, there are still cases where you, where you want to go a step further than this, because this is all about getting the most of your data, out of your data. And um, in some cases, the doing reconstruction of your data will get you things that you, that you didn't expect. For example, you um, um, if you just look at the uh, at, at this structure here, in between these cylinders, you see this black area. Now, it may happen that you know for sure and you want to impose that there is no black area in between the cylinders. That is what we call prior knowledge. And it is possible to include prior knowledge in your statistics as well. And that is through looking at what is called the maximum a posteriori estimate. So that's saying I want to find the most probable X, so the most probable image, given the projection data that I have. It's a very intuitive way of formulating your, your reconstruction, but it is different from the maximum likelihood that I explained before. In fact, you can transform one into the other using a uh, bias rule, uh, which is maybe familiar to you if you've ever taken a course on bias in statistics. Um, and it would transform this into the, into the form that we see here, saying that no longer we just want to find the most likely X that has given rise to my data, but I also want to take into account the probability of even seeing X. And that is what we call the prior. <clears throat> 
because that allows us to encode some images that we really don't want to see because we know that they cannot happen. So that's called the prior distribution. Um, and there, there is an interesting analogy to be made here using uh, filtered back projection again. So filtered back projection can be thought of as using a, an inferior statistical uh, model for the for the forward problem. So an inferior um, model for the for the maximum likelihood estimator. Um, and if you think about the the filter that is used in Fourier space, it's sometimes called a RAM filter. It's, it suppresses the center density of your Fourier space and it enhances the, the outer edges of your Fourier space. And if you do that for, for an arbitrary phantom or using simulating the statistics or simulating noise, you may get an image that looks like, uh, like you see on the left here. And now people have, have realized that oh, well, we don't like this because we see a lot of noise there. And so they, they turn to using different filters. And often this is heuristic, so they say, ah, oh, I will use a filter that looks a bit like this, suppressing the, the outer parts of the Fourier space. Um, and if you do that, you get an image like this. Now that is completely analogous to doing this, uh, to doing this prior trick. So you're saying, I know for sure that I will not have very, very quickly fluctuating structures in my image because that's probably noise anyway. So I'm going to say that a priori that that is something unlikely and I'm going to make a filter that uh, that encodes this. So this is doing a reconstruction using a different, imposing a different prior knowledge. Um, now this is a very simplistic example. But what we have seen in the past 10 years, 20 years, is that um, significant advances in reconstruction have, have come from this. So for example, here's another example from our own research, is where we have uh, imposed a prior that expresses the, the temporal behavior of our sample. That takes a bit of explanation. So on the left here, we see three reconstructions of a sample. Uh, which was uh, which was of a simulated um, uh, mineral material, where there is a so-called Haynes jump at a particular point in time. So as you can see here, this pore here it's white, and here it jumps to black. Now this is really difficult to handle in reconstruction because, as you can see, this jump happened within the scope of just 12 degrees of our acquisition rotation. So you can actually never really reconstruct that perfectly using the techniques that I've explained until now. Um, and if you try anyway, you using the algebraic technique, for example, and you reconstruct these sequences, then you see that that, that pore here, it's not reconstructed properly. But if you try that anyway, and you impose temporal consistency, saying that a priori your images should resemble one another, then you can get the reconstruction you see here, for example where you can resolve that pore in the middle. So this is just a, a very brief sneak peek into what is possible if you, if you tailor a particular prior distribution and have that help your reconstruction in an algebraic sense. Um, since I'm running towards the end of the lecture here, um, I, I don't want to um, end this lecture without at least saying a little bit uh, of uh, something about machine learning, because that is really the, the elephant in the room nowadays when you're talking about reconstruction. And that's because people have realized that if you if you feed software with, with thousands and millions of examples of the image that you, you like, you can uh, you can learn a prior distribution from these many images and use that in reconstruction as well. Um, here's some examples from, from a paper that, that you can look up. So if you were to do reconstruction of the sample in, in a classic way, you get, uh, you get a reconstruction for sure, but you see that it's quite blurry in many regions. Whereas if you use a um, if you use the the um, uh, the machine learning here to learn what structures really look like at high resolution and apply those, you can get much sharper um, uh, reconstructions. So that is sort of where we are going to in the future of reconstruction. So that wraps up the, uh, the introduction to the reconstruction um, of, of X-ray CT data.
Um, some take home messages is that, well, it's, it's important to be aware that there are alternatives. Um, the classic filtered back projection is fine, it's fast, it works. But in some cases, if you want to if you want to beat the statistics, if you want to beat the noise floor just a little bit, you can turn to these algebraic techniques and applying appropriate prior knowledge can really elevate the quality of your reconstruction if, if that is uh, the route that you want to go. 